morning, everyone. I want to begin by uh, talking, the subject matter is the, is the new strategy, and I want to begin by suggesting that there's never been a time, at least in recent memory, when there was more pressures on the C-suite and management teams to come up with new approaches to corporate strategy. The problem is that the traditional models for corporate strategy just aren't enabling people to keep up. A proof point of that is that the lifespan of the average CEO is now down to less than three to five years, which is less than a third of what it was just 30 years ago. And it's not like the pool of those people is getting stupider. The problem is that strategic models that they're using just aren't able to keep up with the pace of change. So, let's see if that works. Um, the context that I'm speaking in is what we're calling the digital convergence. And it may seem ironic to cite a traditional strategy firm in a talk about the need for a new strategy, but despite the challenges to their business model, there's still a lot of smart people, uh, smart people at McKinsey. And they wrote an article last September that talked about the competitive position of every firm in the future, or service performance if you're a government organization is going to be determined by the particular way that you weave together the different strands of strategy, design, and technology. Which is not to suggest that those are all of equal weights to every company. They're going to be quite different. Um, the weighting is going to be different. The fabric is going to be different. The tensile strength of your particular approach to strategy or design or technology is going to be different. But again, your competitive position, how you're going to perform in the marketplace, is going to depend on how you weave those things together. So that's the context for the talk. And I'm going to return to that image several times as a signpost for where we're at as the talk unfolds. So traditional corporate strategy has been based for over 200 years on traditional capitalist economics. That's Adam Smith. Um, he wrote The Wealth of Nations, which was sort of the Bible of traditional capitalist economics way back in 1776 the year the American Revolution started. The problem is Adam Smith got a couple of fundamentals really fundamentally wrong. And there were two essential propositions at the heartbeat of the wealth of nations. One was that human beings would make rational decisions in their own self-interest in the marketplace. Now, we've known for a long time that that's not true, that people make irrational decisions, particularly on the buy side, all the time. The problem is there really wasn't any science behind that, and we'll come to that uh, a little bit later. The second proposition in the Wealth of Nations was that there was an invisible hand that would roll up all those individual purchase decisions to the overall betterment of society. So the global economic crisis, the GFC of 2008-2009, revealed some really fundamental fracture points at the bedrock, at the foundation of the modern economy. And while it was a big deal for us, I mean, it was the biggest global economic crisis since the Great Depression, certainly the, the biggest in most of our uh, living memories, um, it's worth remembering that there have been global economic crises almost every generation for the last 250 years. In other words, for the entirety of the modern capitalist period. And there have been major regional economic crises or, or economic crises affecting multiple regions around the world at least every decade. So the invisible hand didn't seem in the long haul to actually work towards the overall betterment of society. Now, I don't expect you to know who that guy is. He was a leading figure in early American retail. He's credited with the invention of the price tag, the money-back guarantee, and he started the first department store in Philadelphia. But everybody knows the quote. And that's really just another way of saying that predicting consumer behavior for most of the, of the, of, of the 20th century has been, and the 21st century, has been really, really difficult. And that there was almost no correlation between how much money you threw at trying to motivate a, a consumer behavior with what you could actually predict that, that behavior would be. And that, may, that holds across not just B2C uh, consumer decisions, but B2B uh, consumer decisions as well, how, how other businesses buy from your business. It's really only been in the last 10 years with the development of behavioral economics that we began to get some science around this. So books came out like Predictably Irrational, Nudge, Spin, and we've actually got a number of people, including Fabio Pereira. Fabio, put your hand up. 
who spent a lot of time on this and actually developed a lot of expertise around, around behavioral economics, so I urge you to, to see Fabio and some of our colleagues out about that. Um, but the point of behavioral economics was that people make irrational decisions in the marketplace all the time, but in very predictable ways. And of course, the difficulty for us is trying to figure out what those patterns are, to put some, si to put some science to it. Let me just give you a few examples. There's lots of them. Um, availability bias. Most people, despite the fact that they don't think they do it, will spend an inordinate amount of money to satisfy a need that they feel right now, even if the rational thing was to wait until the price came down. Sunk cost fallacy. We see this one all the time, particularly on major business initiatives and particularly on, on IT projects. You spent millions and millions and millions of dollars on something, now egos are at stake. Jobs are at stake. Corporate futures are at stake. So rather than cut it off and, and write it off, you'll throw more money at it. It happens all the time. These kinds of irrational decision-making pr problems, again, only became obvious and there began to be some science around them in really the last 10 years. And the trick for all of us is, how do you figure that out for your business? Now, we all know, you know, you've seen a slide like this at every conference you've been at for the last 10 years, you know, the inexorable increase in the rate of business change. And we all, we all are pretty familiar with the statistics. A generation ago, the average lifespan of a company on the Fortune 500 was 67 years. Right now, that's down to less than 15 years and is rapidly heading towards five. We've pretty, pretty much all of us seen this study that uh, analysts are predicting that 80% of the companies on the Fortune 500 won't be there at all in 10 years. And everybody knows that that rate of business change is, is not going to go down. Um, the other thing that, that, that uh, you know, that the, the image uh, conjures up, which is one of the reasons we selected it, uh, was, it, was the obvious connotation of the digital tsunami, which is sweeping across virtually every industry sector. Now, just on the plane last night flying down from Sydney, I read an, an interesting study, and I just wanted, I made some notes because I didn't want to get it wrong. I just wanted to share some of these, some of these sort of latest statistics because they were striking. The authors of the study looked at 8,000 firms that were successful enough to have reached $500 million in annual revenue. So not startups, not small businesses. We know very, very high failure rates for both of those. Two-thirds of those firms in the 15 years ending in 2013, so just two years ago, experienced what the authors called stall-out. And stall-out was defined as going from double-digit growth, annual year-on-year -year growth rates to low single digits, and in many cases, negative growth. What was even more striking and, and alarming about the study was that of the top 50 firms that they looked at, that change, that sudden collapse, occurred very rapidly within one to two years. And my own observation is that that was closely associated with the deer in the headlight syndrome. You know, like they really didn't know, they didn't see it coming and they didn't know what to do about it. The authors of the study then looked at uh, the top 50 of the firms um, the, uh, in, in that study. And the collapse in those top 50 firms was, in, was within one to two years. The authors then interviewed 400 uh, CEOs of comp global companies with revenues of over $5 billion uh, per annum. And 94% of the leaders of those companies said that the biggest problem that they had in maintaining profitable growth was not the lack of opportunity in the marketplace, and it was not competitive activity. It wasn't that they were being outdone by, by some competitor. It was internal dysfunction. So, just as in nature, where natural selection does not necessarily reward the biggest and the meanest beast, so in corporate life, the ability to succeed depends on rapid adaptation. How fast can you react to things that you don't necessarily see coming at you? So, to move the, move the, the time scale forward a little bit, one of the uh, giants of modern corporate strategy was Michael Porter, who wrote Competitive Advantage back in 1985. And Porter was closely associated with the idea of sustainable competitive advantage. That is the idea that if you created an innovative new product or service, 
or you cracked into a new customer segment, or you could develop in a, a totally different geographic market, and you could either discover or create effective barriers to entry for your competitors moving into that area, you could achieve long-term sustainable competitive advantage, 5, 10, 15 years. That's mainly over now. And um, the, thing, the thing that we see companies dealing, dealing with now is what Rita McGrath, who teaches at the Columbia Business School, wrote a book two years ago called The End of Competitive Advantage, where she said, we now live in an area of transient advantage, where you're going to have to be working on and renewing your strategy all the time, constantly, continually, iteratively. And one of the things that McGrath said was the key for management now is the ability to experiment and rapidly learn from those experiments. So this is a major change in corporate and particularly in management culture. Um, it's much more difficult than the transition from waterfall to agile software development, and that took 10 or 15 years. The ability for managers to say, we're going to have to give up on the idea that we can predict, it, predict everything in five or ten year planning cycles off of spreadsheets is a, is a really difficult thing. Because while it's okay if you're a corporate leader to be wrong, at least occasionally, it's almost murder to be uncertain. So how do we embrace that uncertainty? How do we learn how to experiment our way into the future instead of thinking we can predict it off spreadsheets? If you find that a really scary notion, think about it as nothing less than the application of the scientific method, which has been around for a long time and still works. You have a hypothesis, you construct some tests, is that hypothesis true or not, you, go, uh, you execute those tests, you go get some data, and then you move on. You, you find out either that was true or false, and, and what do we learn from that experiment, and, and move on. And when you think about it, what are your alternatives? I think most people have heard of the HIPPO principle, and I think of it particularly uh, relevant when I think about how companies are doing innovation. And I, I work with a lot of enterprises that, uh, most of whom have some kind of innovation initiative going on, and many of them are relatively democratic. You know, everybody can toss their ideas into some, into some suggestion box. Maybe every quarter there's a, there's a showcase or a shootout where you can come and present your idea. But in 99% of the cases that I know about, the HIPPO principle prevails. The, some scene, the way that the decision gets made as to where corporate investment funds are going to go between the range of those potential innovation initiatives is based on, on the highest paid person in the room saying, yeah, I like that one. Not based on real data, not based on customer feedback, based on guesswork. So, which would you rather have it? Scientific method or relying on guesswork? The point that I would maintain here is that the key to strategy innovation is reducing the cost of experimentation. I still know a lot of companies where the idea of a minimum viable product costs a million dollars, and where the release of a new product takes 12, 14, 18 months. At ThoughtWorks, we tell our customers, if you can't get something up in at least three months, rethink what you're doing. If the release of a new product takes nine months, 12 months, 18 months, it's just too slow to get back the fast feedback that you need for how those new products and services might fare in the, in the marketplace. And I want to suggest that there's three levels of strategic innovation that you need to be thinking about. And you need to, again, be thinking about them, to, to paraphrase uh, McGrath, you need to be thinking about these and working on them all the time, not every three or five years. Business model innovation, management model innovation, and product and service development. First, just a moment about, uh, let's just take uh, business model innovation. Now, on the one hand, this has been overhyped. Uh, I mean, you're all not going to go out of business tomorrow. The studies ref uh, indicate that about 15% of companies have really experienced serious disruption to their business model. Um, now, that's of little comfort to you if you own a newspaper or you're in the music business or you own a taxi cab fleet. Um, but the reality is, you know, we're all not going to go out of business tomorrow. The cautionary note, I mean, the bad news is uh, nobody's immune from this. And so regardless of what industry vertical you're in, there is some kid in Bangalore or Santa Clara or the outskirts of London who's, who's thinking about how to come after you. 
or there's some big industrial giant in a completely different industry, often a technology company, that's decided to move into your industry, like Google and Apple have done in, into financial services and payments. So you, ne you need to be thinking about your business model and constantly querying whether or not you've got that right. Management model innovation. The reality is that our management models have really not changed very much since 1911 when Frederick Winslow Taylor wrote and published the, really the first modern book on, sci on, on management called Scientific Management. And in that book, he maintained uh, a, the essential proposition of scientific management was the managers do all the planning and thinking and the workers do what they're told. We all know that doesn't work anymore particularly for knowledge workers, who are the ones that we're all, you know, scrambling with each other and competing with each other, trying to recruit. The best and the brightest people are simply not going to work in corporate environments like that. We all know from Dan Pink's work and a lot of other studies about, about what motivates people, that people want autonomy. They want a sense of mastery. They don't want to feel like somebody's standing over them all the time telling them what to do. They want to feel like they're getting better at their job every day, and they want to feel like that they're working for a higher purpose. Uh, and unless we provide the work environments that stimulate and attract those people, they're not going to come to you or they're going to come for a short time and then leave and, and move on to somebody else. The other thing about the traditional management model, the hierarchy that, you know, we all know what the org structures look like in most, most large enterprises, is that it kills innovation because everybody in those hierarchies is incented on the existing business model, just keeping the wheels spinning around faster, churning out today's products and services. Hardly anybody is incented on sticking their neck out and trying something different. Now, there's lots of experimentation going on where people are trying different things because everybody's aware of what that problem is. So you find a lot of companies experimenting with forming guilds, you know, the Spotify model, ThoughtWorks, I'll let you in on a secret, ThoughtWorks is experimenting this year in many of our regions uh, with adopting uh, a, a model called the second operating model uh, from John Cotter at the Harvard Business School. He's, if you don't know Cotter, he's written 17 books on organizational design. Uh, he taught at Harvard for 29 years. Um, and he wrote a book a couple of years ago, uh, which won a lot of awards as, as a breakthrough uh, management thinking book, um, called Accelerate where he said you can't get rid of today's corporate hierarchy because that's what's bringing in all of today's revenue. But you need to graft on top of that a fundamentally different kind of op operating model, a second operating model that's fundamentally different in nature. It's not hierarchical. It's networked. It's voluntary. It's composed of people who are probably a little bit bored with the old business model and want to try to find something new. And how to nurture that and, and encourage an environment where that kind of, that kind of collaboration uh, and, and voluntary networks can form to look at, at new products and services and new approaches to strategy is, is not easy. And lastly, product and service development. The reality is, that, and again, this is not a new statistic, looking across all industry verticals, about 80% of, of, of new products and services that are released every year don't survive to see their third birthday. So it's a, pretty, it's a pretty sharp failure rate. So we're going to have to do a lot more of experimentation around product and service development. Now, again, that may sound scary, but there's a lot of frameworks around that can help you with how to conduct those experiments. Let me just go through a few. Let's take a couple of uh, potential business problems. Let's say you want to reduce the cost of acquisition for new customers, or you want to simplify an, an existing business process. The first thing you need to do is get out of the office. Don't rely on traditional market research or focus groups that are filtered to you by, uh, by your research department. Actually, get out and see what customers actually do. What do they do in the marketplace? What do they do with respect to your competitors? What do they do with respect to your, to, to, to your products and services? Out of that is going to emerge some candidate problems or some opportunities that you might want to look at in, in more detail. You can then assess the viability of those or the impact on your bottom line. Is that something we're good at? Could we, could we develop that products and services? Are, are we competent at that? Or can we go out and acquire those competencies? And that's going to lead you to a first expression of strategy. You then take that first expression of strategy and try an experiment. Try to build something. Try to build a minimum viable product and do it rapidly. We've done a lot of work in recent years with Expedia, which I'll just cite as one example. Expedia now runs 1,500 experiments a year. And you can do the math and figure out that a lot of those are taking a day or two, not weeks, not months. 
getting very rapid feedback and then discarding the ones that don't work without having spent a lot of money on them. And in, in Expedia's case, they figure 70% of their experiments won't result. And they quickly d disband them, get, uh, do away with them, and move on to the ones that they think might have more merit. So rapid experimentation, again, to reduce the cost of experimentation and, and move on. As a result of that kind of development of, of a test that you do in the marketplace, you're going to refine and adapt your strategy. Again, you're going to discard the things that didn't work and, and double down on the things that you think might, might be more valid. And then you can actually build that product or service out. You can, uh, you can go to the market, you can get the feedback, and again, I would emphasize the feedback is what is going to enable you to refine and build on that initial attempted strategy. So, New approaches to strategy are required. How does that play into the other elements in, in the diagram about design and technology? Um, there was a front page article in the Harvard Business Review last year that talked about the evolution of design thinking, where companies are now applying this not just to product and service development, but actually to how they formulate strategy. So, a um, little poll here. Let me see a show of hands. How many people believe that design thinking is well and truly embedded in their organization? I asked that question a few weeks ago at a conference. I had one guy stick his hand up. Today, today nobody. I mean, that, that's, that's not unusual. Um, you, you know, that's pretty common. Um, way, many years before I worked for ThoughtWorks, I worked for another technology con con consultancy that actually sold uh, design and user experience research. And I thought I understood it, but I didn't. I thought it was just visual design, and I think that's a pretty common misconception um, among a lot of people. It's not about eye candy. It's about the entire service experience that your customers, again, whether you're in a B2C business or B2B uh, business, the customers have with you across all the touch points that you have with them. And there is a remarkable uh, uh, um, surge of interest in design thinking right now. It's, it's, it's a gold rush out there. And one of the reflections of that is the number of design firms that are being acquired, uh, either by big consultancies or by big industrial companies. And it's just, this is just a, a partial list. A cautionary note again. We know from the history of mergers and acquisitions that about 75% of them fail within two years and almost always for the same reason, that is a clash of cultures. And I think the possibility of this going badly is fairly high. You take small design firms with a high degree of alignment, very collaborative, very, very aligned in their thinking of, uh, about the design problem, and you dump them into big consulting or big corporations, the chances of that not working out, I would suggest, are, are, are fairly high. But the jury's out. We'll see how that works out. But it is a testimony as to the gold rush that's going out there as people are trying to bring on design thinking in, in their organizations. Um, it's a model that we use about what the design thinking process looks like, pretty, pretty, pretty standard. The thing that I would emphasize as important is the feedback loops. Once again, keeping those as, getting those as short as possible is actually key to the, to the design thinking process and the idea that, that, that you're never done. You just have to keep iterating on every element of this all the time. How does good design then fit in? Is it technologically feasible to build the thing that you're, you're thinking about? Is it viable for your business? Can you actually make money at it? If you can satisfy those two criteria and you can satisfy the usability and desirability features that your customers might want, that's when you nail it and where design actually results in innovation. So, we've talked about new approaches to strategy, we've talked about the, the rise of design thinking and how that plays into the formulation of strategy. Let's talk about technology. The lost decade. Um, I think most of us lived through this. It came after the dot-com bubble crashed in 2001-2002. And boards who had spent millions and millions and millions of dollars on failed internet initiatives uh, suddenly cut the funding off. And for those of us in the IT industry, it was pretty grim uh, for, for quite a few years. Um, one, of the, one of the signposts of that was um, Nicholas Carr at MIT wrote a book, came out in 2004, called Does IT Matter? And the subhead was for competitive advantage. And his answer was, not much. 
And he likened information technology to electricity, just a utility. You know, you turn it on, you turn it off, you dial it up, you dial it down, but it really doesn't matter because it's ubiquitous. Everybody's got access to it. So it, as a factor for competitive advantage, it really doesn't matter. Companies responded to that, whether or not it's true or not, I'll come to in a minute, responded to that by a massive belt tightening on, on IT expenditure. And, and if you're in, you were in IT, you all know that. For years after year after year, CIOs, uh, their departments were re reviewed as cost centers, not profit centers, and one of their, their major priorities was just cut, cut, cut your budget, restrain spending. Companies outsourced uh, to the uh, offshore vendor where they, they thought they could get the cheapest rates, and they decided just to buy packages for virtually everything. Um, that's Jose Alala. He is the CIO at BBVA Bank, uh, and before he was the CIO, he ran their innovation center. Um, BBVA Bank is regarded as a Spanish bank, is regarded one of the most innovative banks um, uh, in Europe and, and probably globally. Um, and at a large industry conference of several thousand CIOs back in 2011, again, sort of a signpost, wasn't that long ago, um, he, he brought a, a wave of uproarious and understanding laughter from, all, from his assembled colleagues by saying, you know what, it's impossible to talk to the board about strategy. They just don't care and they don't understand. Well, that's rapidly changed. They care now. And it's a result of that digital tsunami, which has made technology much more important, in the, at least in the viewpoint of the boards, than it was in the previous 10 years. <clears throat> There's lots of quotes on this, just a couple, and you may have seen these before. Um, Jeff Emmel, the CEO of the largest industrial company in the world, General Electric, if you went to bed as an industrial company, you woke up this morning as a software and analytics company. Uh, PwC just came out with their 17th annual CIO survey here in Australia. 91% of Australian CEOs believe that technology is the single biggest opportunity for transformation. So this is not something, you know, it applies to some other country and not Australia, it applies here as well. And that's, that, that shift in thinking from just the early part of this decade to now, again, as a result of, uh, of, the, of digital disruption, it's causing a big shift in the way that we need to think about technology. The need to rebuild internal capability. I see so many large enterprises, and of course it might not apply to you, but it does to a lot of enterprises out there, that have just outsourced way too much capability. And they're now realizing they have to rebuild some of that essential capability and bring it back in-house. It's just too important to think you can outsource it to, to some external body. Talent acquisition and retention strategies. Now, number one issue on most CEOs and C-level executives um, uh, must do list. Uh, and I tell my colleagues from the United States, you have no idea how tough it is. I mean, you've got a talent pool in, in North America, 350 million people to draw from. I got 25 million. Uh, much, you know, it, it's murder uh, here in Australia trying to recruit and, and retain top talent. So it's a challenge for everybody. Buying packages cannot achieve differentiation. Now, there's lots of things that, pa that software packages are good at. You know, um, your ERP system, your human resource system, your finance system, you're probably going to buy a package to, to do most of those kinds of things. But for your customer-facing initiatives, for the things that are really strategic to you in the new digital era, if you buy the same package that everybody else can buy, you, it simply can't be a source of competitive differentiation. So you're going to have to think about what kind of custom software you're going to have to write that's different than your competitors. And lastly, we're going to have to think about new approaches to architecture. Um, you know, there's the old quote, what got you here is not going to get you there. And, and think about that as, 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 as it applies to your business and your information technology architecture. Because the architectures, Gardner said a couple of years ago, the architectures of the last 20 years are going to be obsolete. We're going to have to think about much more modular architectures. We're going to have to think about how to incorporate emergent design and evolutionary architectures and utilize the power of probably microservices in order to do that. So that's a massive shift in the way that we're thinking about the way we use technology in, in the era that we're in now. So, Strategy, design, technology. Again, how you weave those together is going to be unique to your company, but it's going to be fundamental to your competitive position going forward. 
Which is not to suggest that that's simple. I mean, the strands in each one of those that you're going to have to weave together can be very complicated, very multi-threaded, lots of different components in there you're going to have to think about. But once again, there really, there really isn't any alternative. And I just want to close on a few notes about your personal strategy and, your, and, and how you apply that to your organizational strategy. First, start some experiments. And I don't mean a sandbox or a hackathon. I mean, everybody can do those and lots of companies are. I mean, take a significant business problem and actually start experimenting on that. Because that's the way you're going to get started on introducing the cultural change that, 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 that uh, this kind of experimental mindset requires. Think about the purpose of your organization, not as you view it internally, but in the eyes of your employees, just internally, but in the eyes of your employees, in the eyes of your customers, and in the eyes of society. What is your company, what is the purpose of your, of your company? Gary Hamill, who's been uh, written, written up, has had more articles published in the Harvard Business Review than any other living author, uh, did a study, uh, wrote an article called Moon, uh, My, uh, Moonshots for Management back in 2009. And it was the result of a three-day retreat. He took 50 of what he thought were the most innovative CEOs in, in America away for a, a retreat. And they, they thought about what are the, tw the 20 big moonshots for management for the 21st century that are going to be different than 20th century management. And the number one recommendation that they came up with was that modern corporations are going to have to repurpose themselves because simply maximizing shareholder value is no longer sufficient. It just isn't motivational enough to bring the best, the brightest people to work for you. So I've done this before, but let me see a show of hands in, in this audience. How many people feel like they come to work or their colleagues do every day pumped up and excited and motivated primarily about maximizing shareholder value. It's always the same. I, I mean, I've yet to have any, I mean, I might, I, might, I might get a different result in, this, in an audience entirely of C, CEOs, but, you know, most of us aren't. And, and it's just not what, what, you know, keeps you excited about coming to work every day. So you're going to have to think about what is the bigger purpose that your organization fulfills in order to really be successful. There's a second level that I want to think, you about that, uh, think about that on, and that is how does your own personal purpose feed into that? Stephen Covey, who wrote this, The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, wrote another book, which many of you may not have read, called The Eighth Habit. And in that he said, you need to think about legacy. What do you want to leave behind? And he asked the rather confronting question, what do you want people to say at your funeral? It's probably not that lady project managed 20 of the, the biggest IT projects that our company ever did. Or that guy contributed at least 3% to our increase in earnings before interest and tax. Probably not. It's probably going to be something like what a great person that was for their family. Or they really gave back a lot to their community. Or they did something to at least leave a lasting and positive impact on society. So that kind of purpose is something that, you know, we don't think about a lot, but you need to think about, not only in terms of your personal responsibility, but how that lines up with the organization that you work for. <clears throat> and lastly, think about technology and human inequality. And I just want to leave you on this note. We live at the time of the biggest uh, breakthroughs in, in, in technology that we've seen since the Industrial Revolution in, in over 200 years. And yet, the fan and it's an exciting time to be in technology. Lots of new and exciting things are happening and things that we can't even manage we know are not that far over the horizon. But it has not solved the problem of human inequality. In fact, it's gotten much worse. We all heard about the Oxfam report that came out just a few weeks ago that 62 families and the richest 62 families in the world control more wealth than the bottom three and a half billion people in the world. And it's not just a rich countries versus poor countries thing. The level of human inequality in the United States, the UK, all the countries in the OECD, including Australia, although it's not as bad here, is worse than it has ever been. So despite all the advances and, and all the, the whiz-bang stuff that modern technology has, has brought us, it is not addressed, and indeed it has made the problems of human inequality in, uh, fantastically worse. I saw a study just recently where um, inequality in the United States is now greater 
than it was in 17th century England. And if you look at the American economy, George Soros made a point about the GFC that 65 years of world economic growth, and one of the things the GFC signposted was that 65 years of world economic growth based on the U.S. economy is over because fund the fundamental locus of economic growth has now shifted to the east, mainly to, to India and China. So we have to think about the fact that governments aren't doing much about this. You know, they're caught in short-term electoral, electoral cycles, uh, the ability of any politician to stand up and say, we, you know, we have to make substantial investments to solve this problem over the next 10 or 15 years. And by the way, I'm going to have to increase taxes to do that is very unpalatable in, in most political circles. Um, and, you know, in, in private industry, we, we've got other, other things on our mind most of the time on, on, on our day jobs. But this is a huge and enormous problem for us. And once again, an indication that the invisible hand has failed. It has not solved this problem of human inequality. It's gotten fantastically worse, and we need to think about what we're going to do about that. And with that, I'll close and take any questions you've got. Thank you.